here. So <clears throat> I will call to order the uh, meeting of uh, Wenham Finance and Advisory Committee at 6.33 p.m. on Wednesday, January 17th. Uh, we are, uh, as I said, we have a, a full house. So uh, myself, Scott, <clears throat> Finn, uh, Dano, and uh, Dave are all joining us this evening, uh, as well as uh, Jeff Soulard. And our guest this evening, <clears throat> Kim Butler, uh, library director. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to spend a little more time uh, with you and, and looking at your budget request uh, for FY25. Uh, and in particularly uh, given that uh, there is a capital request, uh, which uh, was not part of the presentation uh, that those few Saturdays uh, ago. So I thought uh, we could spend a little time uh, on that as well. Uh, but let's start with the, uh, just with, we're in the operating uh, budget on the, on the screen at, at the moment. Um, I know on, the, on that Saturday meeting, Kim, you, you, know, you did offer a bit of a summary of what the past, past uh, fiscal year looked like, or calendar year, I should say. In, in terms of increased uh, uh, utilization of the facility. So and maybe if you, if you wouldn't mind, just take a few minutes to recap again. Uh, I believe uh, at least one of our, our members uh, was not able to make that Saturday meeting. Sure. Um, so in terms of overall budget um, for fiscal 25, um, I know we talked at the Saturday meeting about the the salary increases. Those are all union negotiated salaries with the um, the new three year uh, contract that was approved. So this will be going into the second year of the second fiscal year of that contract. So all of those increases that you're seeing in salary are are contractual. Um, in terms of um, everything else that goes with running a library. Um, Mostly, we were pretty much level funded as best I could manage. So we do see some increases um, in in some of our contract services. Um, in terms of library books, um, we have to spend as a requirement to meet our um, state aid requirement to get our state aid funding. Um, we have to spend 16% of our budget on what they call materials. Um, it can come from a few different line items. It doesn't just come out of um, library books, but that's why we traditionally like to increase that line item every year, just to make sure the state sees that we're, we're devoting the money that we should be um, into materials. And that's obviously expanded greatly, um, the definition of materials over, over the years, and in particular, the last five years, mm. um, with eBooks and e-audiobooks being um, such a huge part of our circulation. Um, that's something we're looking at as we break down that that line item into individual um, collections. Um, we're devoting more money, more and more money into our ebook collection um, to meet our patron demand. Um, our periodicals are your collections. I, I'm just curious uh, to you know, there's so much content out there to select from uh is that within your staff are there state uh, recommendations uh, who, who has uh the kind of final authority over that sure um so we have um individual staff members that are responsible for collections um my mm -hmm. children's librarian buys the entire children's collection my teen librarian does all the ya young adult materials um my assistant director buys all of our fiction. I have somebody that buys all of our audio visual. I do all of our nonfiction. Um, and there are standard review journals that, that we subscribe to. So everybody sees those and can read the reviews and decide you know, within their allotted budget what they wanna spend. Um, and again, like I said, we, we look at it pretty significantly every year I've done a new sort of spreadsheet breakdown having now that I've been in the job for five years or going on five years, I feel like I have 
some good historical data to to legitimately make some better decisions about how much money we spend in each area. So we're going to take a really hard look at the breakdown of that 143,000 as we go to fiscal 25. So um, that'll be good. And Kim, this is Dave. How are you? How are you? Good. Um, I wanted to sort of get a feel for if you look at that acquisition of library books, how do you look at either patron usage or the utilization of the resources so that you understand mm -hmm. the utility you're getting for your 143,000? Yeah, I do. Um, so we get statistics from the consortium on um, what items are circulating, um, what collections they're coming from. I do a monthly breakdown for me and hopefully my staff are looking at it as well um, in terms of, you know, we get a little more granular into, you know, we'll take the children's collection and we'll know monthly how many board books went out, how many picture books went out, how many chapter books, how many graphic novels, and they can see individually where where they're seeing the most use and then sort of how to buy um, items. I buy nonfiction, so it gets broken down by Dewey Decimal collection number. So I can see, oh, cookbooks, they're always huge. So I need to continually buy cookbooks um, or travel books. Travel books are massive still and, uh, you know, looking for new um, sources in that. So that's sort of the the granular state we get to. Um, and then, I, like I said, I've started um, a, a new Excel spreadsheet, sort of in a looking at it in a percentage situation of the percentage of ebooks that are going out compared to the percentage of dollars that we're spending. Um, yeah. So that's, uh, that's a whole different way of looking at how we're spending money. And uh, definitely, like I said, something we've, we've got to sit down and, and make sure those percentages are matching and we're not spending too much um, in collections that people don't care about anymore. And in that item of library books, Kim, is that include the eBooks and the physicals in that one line? So I assume over the last, you know, since 21, there's also been a mix shift, right? So it might be helpful going forward to break out that line between sort of traditional print and what you're acquiring electronically, just because I would assume if you were to go disaggregate that 135, which doesn't look like it's been a major sort of inflation over that period of time, that part of it has been the shift away from physical into digital media uh, on a dollar basis, and I'm sure a percentage basis as well. Yeah, absolutely. If you go, I don't know if you guys have this. I can share it with Jeff if he wants to share it with the whole committee. Um, I do when I break down um, that library books line underneath that. We we have traditionally broken into library books, ebooks, okay, DVDs and CDs are our databases and our online resources. So that gets a little more granular. I have yep. kind of flushed around with some of those over the years. Um, and I will say our ebook expenses are split between two line items. So um, it falls under library books, and it also falls under that technology line that M where sure. it says MPLC, that falls Got under that. We split it between the two. Got it. Okay. No, that's helpful. Yep. But it sounds like what percentage of the acquisitions now are physical versus non-physical? That is a really good question. I don't have my spreadsheet with me. That I, I'm at home now, so I don't have my spreadsheet with me that I've been diligently working on. Um, off the top of my head, I, I don't remember what it broke down to be, but it gradually is flipping um, to more to more E than physical. But I'm still shocked that we have huge circulation on our DVDs. Yeah, I, it surprises me every month that we circulate that many DVDs. So. And are you seeing different escalation in like ebook subscriptions or the consortium prices versus like physical books that it's, you know, is one side growing at a faster cost rate than the other? Ebooks and e audiobooks are ridiculously expensive. Um, okay. you, yeah. you could spend $135 on an e audio item. Whereas the actual, if you were to buy the the case of CDs, it might be seventy five dollars. 
There are some some bills in front of um, the Massachusetts legislature to try to bring those costs down. Um, so we'll see where those go. So going forward, if if nothing else changed in the continued migration to ebooks from a smaller percentage of physical, without any change in pricing, there'll be an embedded higher in you know price increase on the digital mm -hmm. distribution unless you reduce the content or find some other way to bring it in. Right, exactly. Okay, thank you. How is the library billed for ebooks? Is it uh, yeah, for a, a certain period of time? Is it number of views? It depends. Every publisher does it differently. So that doesn't make it easy either. Um, they uh, some some publishers let you have it perpetually, and those tend to be very expensive. Some mm. you have them, you own, own them, quote, for a year, and then you can renew your license and pay again for that item. Or you get, you know, 50 circulations, and then you have to, quote, buy it again. Mm. Um, so every publisher does well, it differently. That requires quite a bit of Quite a bit of diligence then so that you're not just spending by renewing uh, on right. uh, books which are not being requested right exactly Hi, kim this is dano um on the phone apologies i wasn't at the meeting on the saturday where you went through things in detail but just do you know off the top of your head in terms of the key indicators like volumes and people coming in and books circuit books being checked out or whatever your primary measurements are just how things are going year over year yeah i mean i would say statistics wise just in general terms of circulation um we obviously it, it's hard because we saw those two year covid years where things just weren't normal at all and then that first year out of covid we had huge numbers and now I the last I would say this fiscal 24 and fiscal 23 I think we've leveled out at where we should be at um fiscal what was it 22 was we've never seen numbers like we saw in fiscal 22 in terms of our circulation um and then I think we've we've sort of reached a, a leveling off point so so that's that's been interesting um it'll be even further interesting. It, it depends on the economy. It depends on the weather. Hopefully there's never another uh, pandemic outbreak, but you know. But what's, what is the main measure of, of usage of the library? I report on so many things to the state. I mean, we, we look at, we look at circulation, which is sometimes an indicator and sometimes not. Um, we look at door count, people through the door um, on a daily basis. We look at, you know, program attendance. We look at, oh my gosh, I do, you know, I do a 50 page report on all our statistics to to the state every year. And it 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 can vary from year to year. I I I struggle sometimes because that's all statistics and I enjoy statistics, but you don't always get the full story from that. Um, there's there's also some of the anecdotal stuff, you know, I, the the people that we see regularly for computer help that come in every day. That's not a stat that we count, but we know we're having impact on their lives. So that's that's where I struggle a bit um, with what we are reporting and what's actually happening in the building. Okay, do we have access to that, Jeff? Did we get that on the 16th, some of the stats, or could we? The um, the Board of Library Commissioners publishes them on their website every year. I think they're as up to date as fiscal 22, and it gets very grainy. It goes into salaries, it goes into, uh, and it's comparative across every um, library in the state of Massachusetts. And at a higher so, level. Okay, great. But then in general, this year versus last year, you would say we're flat, same this year versus last year, you'd say we're more or less? I'd say we're we're trending flat. I mean, we're in the middle of fiscal 24, so it's hard to know where everything will will um 
will end out, but I'd say I'd say we're definitely flat from last year. And then the fiscal 23 was down quite a bit from 22 because of COVID. Well, you, well, 22. I think 22 is an anomaly. I mean, it, it's hard to know. We'll see. I because 22 was huge. I like I said, we've never seen those numbers before in the history of that building. Um, so, yeah, coming back down from that, we'll see. Um, yeah, I think that this year, last year, and this year was sort of we'll sort of see what the the new the new normal is. I guess if that's what we're using. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And and Kim did as part of the uh, budget hearing uh, presentation. It's not so so much comparative uh, information, Dano, but uh, did provide uh, some uh, FY twenty three stats on uh, uh, people through the door and there's several uh, categories that are summarized that um, I can forward back out uh, just to. To, for you to have a sense of the volume of transactions, essentially, uh, that the library processed, but it it is for that one year, so you, you don't have the comparative to uh, to prior. But I guess as Kim is saying, it's it's a hard comparison with uh, COVID uh, stuck in the middle. Okay, I've, I've got that. You don't have to forward back out. I'm just thinking, actually, like along. I think it was Dave's point in our last meeting, or at least the last meeting I was at about where we really emphasize and try to be best in class. And we talked about the council on aging and you wonder about the library as an opportunity for that. And that's kind of the, what's in the back of my questioning. So I can tell you that we, in terms of, so the state groups us, groups libraries into population groups um, when they do their reporting and they report out on these giant Excel spreadsheets. So I will say we're the third busiest library in our population group. Uh, the only library that the only libraries that beat us are Bedford and Weston. Um, so we, we we're busier than Littleton. We're busier than Groton. We're busier than Ipswich, Tingsboro, Middleton, some of those other population sizes. Um, uh, within the entire MVLC consortium, we're the sixth busiest out of 36 libraries, which is extraordinary for the community that we serve and the size of our library and the size of our staff. So I will say in terms of those type of statistics, that's where we fall. It's an interesting segue then to uh, some of the questions that uh, I'd asked uh, Jeff to forward uh, on to you earlier today. And I know you haven't had a lot of time uh, to review them, but what caught my attention in looking at your the presentation from, from the budget were a couple of the goals that have been set for uh, FY25. And I, I think we uh, kind of share a, a theme here of uh, trying to, to uh, in, kind of improve the, the messaging uh, of the the services uh, that the town is providing uh, and you know, just what what are taxpayers dollars uh, going going toward and I see that's one of your objectives in FY25 to try to do a better job of uh, <clears throat> coming up with a communication plan uh, and, uh, and and getting that messaging out to the community of all of the resources that the library has to try to capture those people that uh, don't don't know it. Uh, you know, maybe are, are infrequent users or don't even use the library uh, whatsoever. Yeah, we just finished our strategic plan process for the next five years. Um, so, and in doing that, we did you know we did focus groups and we talked to the community and we did public surveys and. There were a lot of survey responses still um, that say, oh, I didn't know you did that. Oh, I didn't know you offered that. So it sort of organically came out of that saying, oh, we need to do a better job. We think we do a good job, but then you find out, oh, maybe we're not. There are areas that we're missing. There must be other avenues that we can explore um, to, to, to get our message out there exactly the same way of, of the, all the things we offer that people don't, don't remember or don't know to begin with. So. Sure. 
Yeah, unfortunately, a survey, though, only provides information from the respondents, mm -hmm. uh, not that yeah. uh, larger population that mm -hmm. uh, didn't respond to the survey and yeah. maybe aren't uh, utilizing the, the library. Maybe they think of it as that place that they had to go to when they were a kid and their parents <laughs> dragged you and the librarian is telling them to be quiet. Uh, just they don't know what the modern library is or the resources that it, it, it could provide. So you know, I'm curious if there's much thought yet put into what, what the communication plan looks like, but uh, maybe more uh, uh, specifically, you know, what, what groups do you think are, are you missing? Uh, and yeah, it's a good question. I was talking to my assistant director about it this afternoon, just because we were sort of, you know, bouncing things off of each other. And I mean, I'd say the biggest populations that we see um, and our biggest supporters are families, young families through probably early middle school. And then I would say we skew um, a little bit to our to the older end, our older adults that that should come in and and want items. So I feel sometimes like we miss that that middle grouping um, that that we need to be uh, more engaged with. I will say the consortium's done a really good job of of pivoting some of those services with they just launched um, their new e-card service. So you can register for a library card online and get access to all of our electronic resources without ever having to walk into the building. Um, which <laughs> it, it's it's great because we're we're giving people more access to services. I struggle a bit with never seeing people, but I get the I get the mentality, and <laughs> I'm I'm a Gen Xer, so I I, uh, I I still feel like I think like oh I I have to do that in person, and it, there's a whole grouping of generations behind me that that will never think about that. So. Um, trying to be more open to those those changes and ideas but, but yeah I'd say those are our, our groups our, our young families and our older adults and, and, and the, old, uh, the ones that are taking advantage uh, to the, today so the, I guess the challenge then is you know, how to how to grab the folks that don't have young children uh yeah. and are not seniors that right and also, uh, as you pointed out, you know, when and how can you uh, possibly adjust your hours to accommodate them? And then can that be done <clears throat> within the existing budget? Or does that mean uh, more spending? Is there a way to flex schedules <clears throat> to meet your customers where they want to be met uh, at the current spending levels? Yeah, the biggest thing I think we're missing and that we heard from people, again, the people that responded um, when we did our surveying, um, we we used to be, before the pandemic, we were open till eight o'clock on Monday nights. Um, and we haven't gotten back to that yet. We haven't had the staffing to be able to do that. So Monday nights was, was one of the ones we heard um, in our survey. Um, that would probably require at least one more staff person for me to be able to do that. Maybe two. I could maybe do it with one. Um, two, two is always better just in case someone calls out sick, but we could make it happen. Um, the other thing we heard about was Sunday hours. That's such a pie in the sky thing because we'd have to go to the union with it. It would require budgeting for time and a half for union staff. I, I don't, imagine a scenario where either town is flush with hundreds of thousands of dollars that we could legitimately do that. It's nice that people want to see us more. I just don't know how to make that ever work. Um, the more the the easier route um, that's not going to cost us a lot of money and that I'm hoping we can do in the fall of next year, if not the summer, is we we don't open till 10 o'clock. Staff report at nine. We don't open the building till 10. I think we could open at 930. I think we could definitely at least give people that extra half hour in the morning to come in earlier. Um, it wouldn't cost us any more money. It's just a scheduling thing. So that yeah. is a cheap, a cheap answer that we could hopefully help uh, accommodate some of the requests from residents we got. 
Kim, okay. where do we comp out to other libraries? Do other libraries in our consortium, are they open on Sundays? Are they open on Monday evening? Um, do they open at 930? Like where have we had to shave it down because we're Wenham and they're not? Or <laughs> what is, uh, where do we comp out on time? I, I double checked um, some of our close neighbors um, just to see. It's a little all over the map. Um, so Boxford, which surprised me, they're open till seven o'clock, um, Monday through Thursday. Um, Ipswich, Ipswich is open three nights. They're open Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but not Thursday. Um, Middleton, Middleton is open till eight o'clock Monday through Thursday, but they do not open on Saturdays. <laughs> um, and then Topsfield is very similar to us. They're open till seven o'clock Monday through Thursday, but on Fridays and Saturdays, they're only open till two. And then uh, I looked at Bet Danvers and Beverly, which are definitely much bigger communities and they definitely have more hours. They um, do Sundays, they do nine o'clock, they're open till nine o'clock at night every day of the week. So yep. those are a little uh, different comparison, but in terms of location wise, what's close to us. Okay, thank you. And then maybe just last uh, question on this uh, subject for uh, me. Um, again, think, trying to think of uh, of the, the value that uh, the, the various departments and, and resources of the town uh, bring to to residents. Uh, would you say uh, any of the offerings uh, that uh, Hamilton Wenham Library? Uh, provides are unique or uh, you know, kind of standard uh, fare for suburban libraries uh, in our uh, Massachusetts uh, yeah, the, the communities. Yeah, I mean, I think across, you know, there, there are some obviously standard things that everybody offers, you know, we got, we've got books, we've got computers, we've got story times, you know, those are pretty standard things. Um, we've we've tried to be innovative, I'd say, in the last couple of years in terms of our our programming ideas. We had our first um, ever Comic Con event last summer, which drew over 100 people into the building, which was really great. So we're gearing up for the the second year of that, which we hope will be even bigger and better. Um, I I always feel like our summer reading program draws Do people come dressed up. Yes. Yeah, oh, well, I guess Absolutely. it's not a Comic Con if, uh, <laughs> if people aren't coming dressed. Yeah, we had um, I don't I forget the name. There's a group, that, and I I I am a Star Wars nerd to some extent, but not to some, the extent of some of my staff. But there's like legitimate groups that are allowed by Disney and are are able to dress up in those costumes legitimately and be photographed. And it, there's a whole thing anyway. So they were, yeah, they were at our library, but <laughs> we had a lot of kids dress up. We had a lot of adults dress up. Um, so yeah, it, it was, it's a fun event. So uh, that's our second one will be coming up uh, in June. So that's exciting. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I have to hand it to my staff. They're definitely, innovators and they definitely think of outside the box ideas and i think that's that's definitely something we've we've got going for us here um i also think that where we're located plays greatly into some of those stats i talk about we see a ton of patrons from beverly we see patrons from ipswich we see um essex we see manchester we see topsfield we see as far away, and we even see Danvers, we see Gloucester. I mean, it seems like people legitimately travel to our building specifically for our staff, our resources. We hear from people all the time that they prefer our library over Beverly or over some of the other, our other local communities. Um, so that it's nice to hear. And when oh, you look sure, at that our, sounds flattering. When you look at our, it, it factors into our state aid as well. They ask um, mm -hmm. how many patrons we serve. Um, and I don't have that in front of me, but they ask us how many patrons we serve that are outside our um, service area, quote unquote, outside our town limits. And our number for that is usually pretty large, which actually impacts and gives us a little bit more state aid money. Yeah, interesting. 
Thank you for that. Uh, any other operating budget general questions for Kim? I thought maybe we just pivot to the uh, to the capital request, which I will try to bring up. Unless Jeff, are you able to share? Yeah. Um... I know I'm putting you on the spot trying to pull up a document. Yeah, let me just let this just um uh, let me see. I don't know you if you have to uh so share screen. Oh, you have to enable it for me. Okay. Oh, looks like you're looks like you're in. No? I don't know. I've got some odd screen up in front of me right now. Um let's see. Normally I, when I hit well, it just says Maybe we can just talk about it because there's there's a single line item. Uh and that is the uh the painting uh and uh, exterior repair of, of the building. Uh, it was discussed uh, at the budget uh, capital budget presentation uh, that Steve uh, Poulos and, and Jeff Soulard made last night to the uh, the select board. Uh, Wenham's share of that cost is estimated at. Uh, it's twenty six twenty six yeah twenty six thousand uh, seven hundred dollars. Uh, apparently, uh, this would be the first painting uh, of the building since it was built in two thousand and one. Uh, and there's also uh, maybe some of the the clapboard uh, is uh, rotted in, in, in places and, and needs being repaired. Is that fairly yeah. summarize what's going on? Yeah, it's not it's exactly it. It's uh, you can act, you can see if you walk outside the building, um, all of the trim needs to be painted. It's all pretty pretty corroded and and worn away just from you know years of use and wet bad weather. And now that we have a bright shiny roof, uh, <laughs> it stands out even more. Um, and then yeah, we've got those uh, shingle clapboards on half of the building as well. And those are starting to rip and come off the building because um, the you know the nails and the the glue just give out and don't hold anymore. Um, so it's repair of those, replacement of any that are missing, making sure everything is weather sealed and tight, and then just yeah. painting all of the 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 trim mm -hmm. and the doors and and all that good stuff. Yeah, I think most homeowners understand that uh, money spent in, in maintaining uh, is money well spent. Any follow up yeah. questions for Kim related to the capital request? I was just going to ask if there have been actual quotes for this or if the price that we see is just the best estimation. Uh, no, Mike Hardy, um, uh, facilities manager, he went and uh, he got he got quote. It's it's based on prevailing wage. Um, the quote came in about seventy five thousand dollars. So we went up to 80 just for inflation and costs and everything else that, that will probably go into that um, when it eventually comes to fruition, hopefully, um, in fiscal 25. Great, thanks. Well, thank you, Kim, for joining us this evening. Uh, I think we'll, uh, you're obviously uh, welcome to stay. It's a public meeting, <laughs> uh, or we'll, uh, we'll let you go if there aren't uh, any other questions from the committee. All right. Thank you. Reach out. Okay. I'm happy to answer questions if they come up. Excellent. Thank you very much. Have a good Thanks, night. Everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.
Now I'm going to try to bring up <clears throat> the um, uh, the share file uh, with the with the budget, Jeff. Okay. Or let me see, screen share library. Oh, maybe I can get to it. I'm, if you want to, I can reclaim the hosting and I can share mine if that's quicker. Oh, there you go. You got it. Yeah. It looks like maybe we lost Dan. Now he's coming back in. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, yeah, just pulling up the budget. Uh, there we go. Uh, some. Okay, so um, yeah, what we're what we're up to me, of course, talk about this for, and I think you all uh, understand that what we're ultimately working toward here uh, is a recommendation. Uh, with respect and presentation of uh, budget at uh, annual meeting. So I thought that this would be a good time to uh, approach what I, I think is low hanging fruit in terms of uh, unofficial uh, uh, voting uh, on various uh, department line items. Let's just try to focus where there may be uh, continuing uh, question or interest in uh, follow up with any, uh, any any department managers, oh, here we go. Um, and I had identified general government uh, since uh, we we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Public works, which was uh, last week's discussion, uh, health and human services, and water as uh, departments that we might be able to move. Uh, through and uh, kind of a unofficial uh, vote in advance of our official recommendation uh, on, on the budget uh, to just see if we've got some uh, areas we can just take <clears throat> off our uh, uh, list of interest and focus on those that uh, we think uh, we might need any uh, additional discussion about. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> I thought I'd just just kind of go right down the, the list here. Uh, so, so Jeff, before before we do that, um, I I just want to make sure I understand what you're doing. You, you're basically saying, hey, does anybody have any major objections to the budgets of these kind of departments within the Wenham budget, right? Correct. Yes. And yes. then, um, and. I think one of the one of the things I'm trying to wrap my head around, and, and uh, I'm not sure if you're intending to have something up on the screen here, is like the the last time I saw all the numbers kind of hanging together um, was before the uh, the school committee had put together kind of their latest, and I think I, I um, and the thing that I'm trying to figure out is it feels like we're right on the cusp. Of needing to ask for the two and a half percent um, uh, to go to the to the citizens and ask them to to approve going past the two and a half percent. Sometimes we're on one side of it, and sometimes we're on the other. Um, and I think that um, I'm trying to 
you know, what, where while I would be very comfortable in giving you my opinion that I'm, I'm com that I, I like the budgets that the departments have put together, um, you know, if if we end up um, on one side versus the other, that may that we may have to decide: are we going to go to the well and really ask for just fifty or hundred thousand dollars more than the two and a half percent limit, or are we going to um, you know, try to cut the budget so that we don't have to ask the citizens for that. Right. Yeah. And, um, uh, my, uh, thought on that is, uh, that we would not, uh, uh try to, uh, advance and, and get approval for, uh, an override for a, a de minimis, a de minimis, uh, amount that it could be found uh, somewhere in the budget, I think uh, Jeff uh, Soulard would agree it's still you know, a bit uh, fluid, uh, which is why I was saying that this is, yeah, this is this is unofficial. Uh, this is just trying to take a pulse uh, of the committee. Uh, do you want to know more about the the increase in the spending proposed by the select board of town administrator, et cetera? Uh, or not, given the information that we we all know uh, today, uh, so that we can kind of whittle whittle down what or identify areas that uh, you know, maybe there's not uh, support for, uh, and have additional discussions <clears throat> around those areas, but. It is all open. It can be revisited uh, as the circumstances change. The final vote by the calendar that I put together is the end of the month. So end of January uh, on the operating budgets and uh, February, early February on the capital requests, uh, and then middle of the month on the other warrant, uh, articles. So we've got certain things we need to accomplish and want to try to check off some, uh, at, at this stage, but again, if the circumstances, <clears throat> change because the school budget is not final yet. Uh, yeah, I can always revisit. And, and I Jeff, want to make sure that make... we're bringing in the people that uh, as a as a committee, we want to hear from uh, if there's any, any question about <clears throat> well, what they're proposing uh, in, in their spending. I'm sorry, I cut you off, Jeff. That's all right. Um, so I just want to make a quick point sort of to Finn's question of, I, I think the risk of a proposition two and a half override is is pretty minimal at this point. Um, the school number, the operating budget of the school actually came in a little better than the sort of as of right now is better than we were anticipating. Um, so in terms of the prop two and a half number, we're probably fine. Um, but there, you know, there's two components, you know, to the tax rate, there's the prop two and a half, you know, increase, and then there's um, things like excluded debt. So the town has previously voted to approve this fields project, um, which is a vote to exempt debt service from proposition two and a half. And so looking at this year's school budget, um, we're seeing a significant increase in the school debt component. So last year, the school uh, exempt debt service was a little over $200,000 that's jumping to $730,000 this year because the debt service on the fields is in play now. So even though we are not, um, you know, at risk of a proposition two and a half override, I, I think it's fairly safe to say residents are still, there is an extra $500,000 in the budget due to this debt service. So there's, you know, I think it, it you know, it, it, both things are important to keep track of. Um, but um, I, I just wanted to sort of make clear that even staying under the proposition two and a half, you know, operating override number, 
um, you know, you're, you're because this, this uh, school fields project has been approved and is in motion, you know, we're about to feel the impact of that. Um, and, and, you know, like I say, it's half a million dollars. It's, it's a significant number. So if everyone is okay with that uh, approach. Uh... Ben, it's been... I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. I didn't. I here. I was out of, of mute. I was just trying to figure out um, what is the number of households in Wenham. I'm trying to take half a million dollars divided by three thousand households, something like that. Yeah, I mean that's quick and dirty, but um, you know it's really more based on your your assessed value. So sure, you know, that more expensive. Uh, but yeah, I mean if you were to say that there's you know somewhere in the range of three thousand houses. Um, you know, uh, you know, that's $165, $170 a person, um, a per household. Wait a minute, is that right? That's five hundred two three. That's my round guess at yeah. There's yeah, and then of course it could be you know wildly different than that based on yeah. you know assessed values. Um but um and I can try to come up with a you know, a, a quick, you know, sort of what, you know, in Essex, it was really simple because of what the assessed value on the town was. It was basically $1 million of spending was $1 on the tax rate. So, so this would like in Essex be a simple calculation. It would literally be, this is 50 cents on the tax rate, you know, right there. Um, and when one of them, it's a bit more complicated, but, you know, I can work on kind of coming up with that number. And then at least people could know, I know we've talked about this before, you know, if you know your tax bill says your property is assessed at $1.2 million, and we can tell you like that equates to, you know, 51 cents on the tax rate, you know, you can kind of extrapolate it for yourself. I don't know how it was done when they did the fields vote here, but usually it's a pretty typical strategy when you have those kind of votes just to break it down to that number to say, you know, we estimate this is going to be 65 cents on the tax rate so people can you know sort of try and uh, apply it to their own situation mm -hmm. um but we can look at that i can you know that's a number i can probably get you tomorrow sure. so, okay i i understand so um so back to your original request jeff calder um about um kind of look talking about some of the major departments is there something you could put up on the screen when you um uh want to discuss at one of these departments just to give you know which version or what the latest numbers are um, as, as off the top of my head for instance i'm having a hard time coming up with anything that i have a major objection to right um and i'm i'm happy to to tell you that and and figure out how you take that into your into your plans but um you know because the numbers are you know changing from month to month um it'd be helpful to know which which values which um, numbers we're talking about yeah I, I, do you see uh, a sharing of a screen and now this is i can from... see an email address or sorry an e your email box oh Okay, I thought I was actually sharing the um, the budget. Okay, why are you not seeing what I'm seeing? You might have to go down to the um, the bottom. I think the screen share um, in on the bottom of the page on Zoom, and then you can select like what what document you're showing, what screen you're showing. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, Finn. Yeah, I, I thought you were looking at what I was looking at, which was the uh, the budget uh, that Jeff has been maintaining. Nope. Hmm. 
looks like I'm seeing a whiteboard now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. For any of you folks who are more more uh, fluent in Zoom, where where is uh, where would he go to like show pick what screen he's showing or pick what document he's showing? When you hit share screen, it should give you an option of screens versus uh, specific windows, and the windows would be labeled by document that's open on your desktop versus the thought. screen will just show everything that's open. Okay. Give us another try. <clears throat> Okay, Dano. Apologies, guys. This guy was having a little uh, technical uh, difficulty here. Yeah. I'm okay, seeing, how's that? I'm seeing yeah. Excel. <laughs> I assume right. it's the right Excel. <laughs> Thank you for the patience. <clears throat> okay, so this is what I thought we were all looking at when uh, I, I thought we could start uh, moving moving through and just again an unofficial a roll count on I mean, whether there's general uh, agreement with the these requests in these general uh, areas you know, government public works health and human uh, services and and water so um Maybe just starting starting at the top here and, and going through these. And Fifty dollars for the moderator. Can't imagine that's uh, anybody in heartburn. And select board increase has been explained uh, to us. This is a result of going from three to five members. Uh, the town administrator's <clears throat> uh, budget. Uh, I believe that was. Uh, uh, education and training, that's part of Steve's contract, uh, not negotiable at this point. He negotiated it. Uh, our committee, $250, uh, reserve fund, posing, setting aside another $125,000 over which we would have uh, uh, control uh, to actually draw those out of the reserve fund for use, but prudent to set aside funds. Audit cost is level. Uh, the assessor's department, uh, that too, as I recall, is about education, training, uh, certifications. Uh, as we continue to focus on moving the entire town toward 100% uh, valuation. Tax title expense, 10 grand. Uh, finance department. I just call us. That was, yeah, okay. Again, not anything we have any uh, control over. If those are that's part of uh, contract negotiations, <clears throat> legal level funded, 
information information technology we've spoke at length uh, about the additional costs there uh, and can i jump in there real quick jeff yes uh so um you know that we had talked about the information technology a little bit um I want to say it was Dano had some some points on sort of like, you know, what are we paying now for contracts and things? And so we happen to be paying a bill um, the other day. And so I happen to get a look at our monthly sort of service package um, from our, you know, the our sort of, you know, third party IT support. And so we're paying about twenty four hundred dollars a month um, to that to that group. Uh, and that actually includes, um, you know, small, small costs for like um well actually not so that small like for our proof point spam filtering is you know like 850 of that and then we pay 40 dollars for a carbon black uh another kind of security feature but we're paying about 2400 dollars a month for just the general um information or the you know the it services so that's roughly about 20 28 29 thousand dollars a year we're paying there and then you know that budget is about 105 in total um, and I think Dano was kind of, you know, questioning, you know, sort of relative to his own uh, firm, you know, that seemed high. Uh, and in talking with Steve, you know, we also have, you know, the accounting software uh, is actually in this as well. You know, that's another eighteen, twenty thousand dollars um, $20,000. You know, all of our copier leases across all the buildings, things like that are in this number. Um, but I, I know I recall Dano having a question about, you know, geez, what are we paying monthly for support? It seems like it might be really, really high. Uh, so I, I just thought it would be helpful to, you know, throw that number out so that, you know, we, it's, it's not like we have a support contract that's, you know, six or $7,000 a month or something like that. Uh, a lot of it is just the other stuff that kind of gets lumped into IT. Uh, I think it, generally speaking, the town is moving towards having more detail in how we do our accounting so that you have less of this, uh, you know, we could break out the, um, you know, the accounting software and we could break out the copier leases and things like that. So it was a little easier to see rather than just, you know, a hundred thousand dollar number. Um, but I, you know, maybe this is helpful. Maybe it's not, but I thought, you know, given that some comments were made before, um, you know, it might be helpful to throw some extra info out there. Yeah, that's super helpful, Jeff. Thanks a lot. Appreciate that. Sure. And Dano, just because we did lose you for a while, and th thank you for joining again. Uh, you know, we're we're at. I, I followed actually where Finn was asking if we were going over or above and needing to okay. ride, and you talking about not doing that de minimis, and so I'm yeah, I'm yeah. following along where we're okay, at. Okay, 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 great. Yeah, and uh, you know we're we're kind of at the point now, we're following a, a, a similar approach uh, uh, as we did. Uh, last year to try to uh, focus uh, the, the time we have left in the budget cycle in areas uh, of of interest uh, by uh, going through those that uh, you know maybe aren't uh, 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 areas where we have uh, questions uh, and have an, an unofficial uh, approval. Uh, of those budgets <clears throat> leading up to the final uh, binding vote, which is what will actually go into the warrant book uh, you know, in, a, in another few weeks. So maybe, maybe just stop me on any of these uh, if you think it's something that we do need to dive into more. Uh, town clerk uh, it was explained that uh, there's an extraordinary extraordinary number of uh, 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 elections that'll take place this year, and therefore a greater cost uh, associated with those, uh, as well as the cost of <clears throat> mail-in voting, which is now you know baked into uh, the, the numbers that they're showing. But we've got the uh, primary, we've got uh, town vote, we've got the presidential election. So it's going to be a busy year for the clerk's office. Land use. And is... Jeff, there's the, uh, also on the clerk, just remember that we've also got built in about, you know, I think twenty five or $30,000 of potential costs oh, yes. <laughs> associated with the, you know, potential change from an, uh, an elected to an appointed clerk. Um, you know, so that's a that's a big driver as well. Yes. Yep. Good point. Um, yeah. If if the 
if that goes through and the current um, elected clerk is not the appointed clerk, then there will be overlap uh, in order to make that a seamless uh, transition. So the budget reflects the possibility that they'll be, we'll be paying for two clerks uh, for a period of time for that transition. Uh, land use was an increase in hours uh, related to the MBTA uh, uh, requirement of zoning change. We've got the master plan, a lot going on in the land use department. And it's just de minimis amounts for the rest of general government. Uh, can I uh, assume silence means there's general approval uh, of the general government budget as uh, presented based on what we know to date in, in terms of uh, whether we're going to be falling within our, our prop two and a half uh, and other restrictions? This is Finn. I'd I'd say yes. I'm. I don't see any ma major. I don't have any major objections. Okay. Next up, uh, public works. <clears throat> yeah, we we covered that last week. Uh, again, I think these increases are largely, as Jeff uh, had, had indicated uh, before, uh, COLA increases the 2% is within that range of 2 or 3% uh, on the salaries. Otherwise, uh, de minimis, we don't have uh, any control over the refuse uh, contract that was negotiated with 3% increases annually. Uh, as we all know, there is a material change coming, uh, but not for a, a couple of years. So um, as we discuss this, we should be pretty happy with just 3% increases at the moment. Uh, and then cemetery, uh, that's the stipend uh, that will compensate the... <clears throat> Uh, highway and uh, public works uh, department's uh, admin that's uh, being pulled away from those positions uh, to do work on, on the cemetery. Uh, and uh, it sounded, if this was explained, that it was really, those were really uncompensated uh, hours. Uh, so through the payment of that stipend, then she'll be, uh, she'll be paid for the work she's doing. How's the group feeling about public works? Okay. <laughs> Where are we here? Okay. Uh, health and human services. I believe that change is a result of a correction in the budget that uh, had carried over the purchase of a refrigerator from last year's budget into this year's budget. They didn't need another one. That was just, a, I think that was just a, a kind of a typo. So when that was pulled out, they actually have a now decrease. <clears throat> Council on aging, uh, again, two-ish percent two and a half 2.65 percent increase people will find that uh, is also related to cola increases uh, for the salaried staff there and the veterans department is holding steady uh, at uh, 26,222. as a group feeling about health and human services No objections from me. Very good. And then uh, water is filled out. So 
they operate at essentially a, a, a break even. Is that fair, Jeff? Yeah, I mean, they're you know, generally speaking, the water is typically an enterprise fund, which is uh, you know, it really its own silo. But here we're a special revenue fund. But the idea is that you're supposed to bill out, you're supposed to collect what it really costs you to run, uh, you know, with a little bit extra in there for capital. Um, and you know, I'd say they're you know, pretty close to doing that. Um, overall, I mean, it looks like they're um, I'm trying to think of what their big ticket item was. Um, you know, salaries, um, yeah, salaries are up 3.72 uh, in total. Um, most, yeah, it kind of even 3.82 for the COLA, for the wages and about 4.1 for the expenses. Um, you know, they built in some extra for, um, that, that seems odd. Uh, Services. I'm looking at the budget book. There's also some, some uh, longevity uh, monies being paid out. Yeah, and, and that's um, the longevity and clothing allowances, um, which are contractual. Um, you know, you like some of the superintendent's been here for a long, long time, so he's probably at the max of longevity. Um, the secondary operator, um, there's more sort of thresholds of longevity that they're going through, so there could be a little increase in him from like a prior year. Um, but overall, those are, I think those are really honestly just clothing. Um, so um, let me just see. Yeah. Well, actually, no, it's fine. Yeah. So the, the superintendent gets $500 for longevity, he gets $750 for clothing. And then the operator actually gets $750 for clothing. Um, it's pretty standard uh, across like AFSME type contracts. So that's um, not really driving an increase so much. It's, it was part of the budget last year as well. Okay. But we break it out. Um, it looks like the biggest driver, on, honestly, in the expenses is um, the, for some reason, the FY24 budget for electricity was dropped um, for, from a, an actual expense of $31,000 in FY23 to a budget of seventeen five in FY24. So we're seeing basically the the that line item is doubling from seventeen five to thirty five thousand. That's really the biggest driver in the budget. So last year, I don't know if this may have not been updated. Um, the way Steve did it, because there was so much change going on with um, energy prices and things like that, they held it flat year over year and. Put, oh, that's right. And they did like uh, a, a separate pot of money aside. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, so, so, and, that and so it all kind of eats out. Of that approach. Yeah. And so it kind of makes sense. So, you know, like you're saying, Scott, so we went flat here or something, but then there was a pool of money in last year's budget that isn't in this year's budget. So this is just kind of return, returning these budgets to more actual, I would yeah, say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay. It looks like it also may be an issue of classifications. The uh, the gas expense went from forty seven hundred actual to seventeen thousand budgeted. Yeah, that's why twenty four, and now it's down to five again. So the distribution between gas and electric seems to uh, have been budgeted uh, fifty fifty last year, uh, and now it's. Um, yeah, totally weighted yeah, toward core electric. <laughs> yeah, actually, so that's an interesting shift right there. So that you know, that kind of those two are kind of wash each other out. I mean, we've got a forty thousand dollar, in theory, electric and gas has gone up five thousand dollars over the prior year, um, rather than what looks like a big spike in electric, but it's a big reduction in gas. Um, as a side note, I just happened to hear from someone in Essex today that uh, Essex is the um, natural gas contract is expiring. And uh, they were just told, based on a new contract they're getting, to increase their natural gas cost 30%. Ooh. But we were on the like the last year of like a 10 year ridiculous low contract. So <laughs> I think, you know, it was we were due. We knew much like our trash situation. We knew that we, you know, we knew there was an apocalypse coming. Um, but now, you know, now we know it was a 30% hit, which is still pretty significant. Um, so I don't know if, um, 
you know, that that's something for us to be mindful about here is that, you know, hopefully we're going to see energy prices, you know, settle down a little, but um, yeah, we, you know, it's a big part of our budget overall. And, you know, we're kind of at the whims of, of these, you know, providers. <clears throat> Um, it's not on the agenda. Th thank you for that. Uh, it's not on the agenda to, to talk about the capital uh, budget, but it was presented uh, last night to uh, select board. <clears throat> it looks different from uh, what you all uh, had seen before. Uh, Jeff did distribute it by email yesterday and thought maybe we'd just take a take a few minutes to hit the hit the high points uh, we will have an opportunity next week uh, with our uh, public safety uh, officials to, to uh, dig in a bit uh, uh, more into their requests of uh, both uh, operating budget uh, and capital uh, when uh, the chiefs of uh, police and, and fire join us. Uh, Jeff, have... I, was, yes. I was just thinking, you you have the budget spreadsheet up there. On that last tab, that F, FY25 snapshots two, that's the, uh, you had me try to take like another crack at the, like how we broke out the budget. I didn't know if you, you know, you felt like that was worth sharing at all or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Great point. Yeah. So um, you'll remember, you'll recall that the original snapshot, which is this pie chart, uh, I, I broke out and identified spending by uh, uh, department, uh, essentially. Uh, and I had suggested that it, it might be uh, helpful to look at it a little differently and break out <clears throat> uh, education, which the other uh, pie chart did, uh, but also, in, in, at least in my mind, trying to focus areas uh, that uh, there, there may be discretion over uh, to identify Education, uh, which uh, I think as we understand is, is, is a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down. We don't dig into uh, and make uh, uh, budget decisions on the individual line item spending within education, uh, but also uh, to separate uh, wages of the operation of the town and the benefits that are paid to the uh, employees that are being paid those uh, wages. Uh, and then what what's left uh, in the way of uh, general expenses, uh, insurance and debt service. So uh, as you look at this chart, you can see that education is 52, 52.5% uh, of our spending. Uh, wages, uh, which are largely uh, uh, determined by uh, collective bargaining agreements, uh, are another 22 and a quarter percent. The benefits associated with those are another 10 percent. So we, we get down to uh, essentially, uh, and then if you take out the insurance, yeah which we have to have in the debt service, you're left with less than 12% of the town's budget are, are on uh, other areas of, of spending, uh, which may be loosely defined as discretionary, although yeah, those are going to be uh, electricity and gas, as we we're just uh, describing. But not controlled by a contractual obligation. So I thought this was useful, at least in, in, for me, in thinking about you know, where are there opportunities, uh, if need be, uh, to find savings short of cutting staff, 
Uh, and of course, that was not the direction uh, set by a select board. It was uh, level set budget. But I thought this was an interesting way to look at where the town's spending its money, our money, our tax dollars. I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add to the analysis, Jeff. No, and I think that's a good summary. I mean, it, you know, I, I, you know, I think it was a good, you know, ask on your part to just try to look at this a little bit differently. Um, you know, to sort of, you know, it's one thing, you know, the other snapshot kind of looks at, um, you know, what we call the categories. So general government, public safety, you know, health and human services or whatever, you know, which is, you know, it, certainly it's how we, it's, it's what makes up our departments and, and it's an important way of looking at things. But, you know, the way you just, just, just described it, I think is really, um, you know, helpful for a finance committee to hear in terms of, you know, you just kind of position this as, you know, this chart is broken out in terms of sort of like what you can and what you can't have influence over, essentially, you know, you have minimal inf influence over the the, uh, the two education budgets, um, wages, while you it's not that you have zero influence on, um, you know, it's, it's somewhat, you know, minimal uh, over that 22 and a quarter percent. Uh, and, and obviously the benefits are, you know, tied to that sort of directly, um, you know, so then you're really living in that, you know, kind of general expenses and um, the, um, you know, even insurance general is really not, there's not a whole lot of wiggle room in there. I mean, that's really, you know, that's not things like health insurance and whatever that's in your benefits. That's more of our liability, our workers comp, mm -hmm. um, things like that. So there's, you know, if we had less staffing, maybe the workers comp would be lower, but, you know, generally speaking, the, the overall liability insurance probably isn't changing all that much. So, um, you know, it, I think it's useful. I mean, I think it probably can be to some somewhat a little bit discouraging because you look at it and think how much you know influence do I really have in the grand scheme of things um you know when you look at you know almost the entire pie you know somewhere in the area of like 88 percent or something is is somewhat sort of set um you know but it uh, like you say I think it's just another another way of looking at it and I think it can be helpful yeah I thought it was helpful Jeff and I think it's it's almost like a fixed variable analysis. So if we assume that we don't have a lot of leverage over a lot of these items, then the variable is that GNA. And then when it, within that GNA, how much is sort of fixed versus variable? How much of that GNA is to, you got to keep the lights on so you can't start, you know, it would just be an interesting, uh, we don't have to go down rabbit holes. I think, well, we know the answer probably by looking at it. But the question is, where where do we have real opportunities? And maybe it's more on the capital side than the operating side. I don't know. Yeah. And my thinking, too, thank you, uh, uh, David. That was the, the thought. And you know, I thought this could be very, very informative as well uh, to taxpayers uh, in town that are frustrated about the, the level of, of taxes and you know, would like them to come down. And it really does kind of focus uh, the, the view of, you know, what, what can we, what can we attack uh, without dismantling government uh, to try to save some, uh, some money and, yeah, I don't want to say it's discouraging, but it's it, it's certainly informative about you know where where the money is uh, and what the opportunities are, uh, short of just a completely different uh, mandate coming uh, from the executive uh, branch here about uh, town and town services uh, and. Uh, how to how to approach spending? Jeff Dano here. I'd I'd say yeah, super super helpful analysis. But I would just be careful about the conclusions we draw, and be careful where this kind of thinking leads the town or others. I mean, to me, the conclusion is we have to find a way to redesign things, or restructure things, or completely redo our town plan or we're just continuing down a 
a path that's not tenable in the long term. And so to, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like the conclusion is, oh, well, we can't do anything. I'd say the conclusion is let's redouble our efforts to focus on the bigger things that require massive amount of social and political capital to make real change. Agreed. Yes, I think that that is what this illustrates as well. Uh, absolutely. That we're not going to get to material uh, impact on, uh, on, on the tax rate uh, you know, without a disruptive uh, change in in spending uh, and in approach to governing. You know, if so little of the current spending uh, is you know, quote unquote uh, a variable or, or 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 discretionary, and and really it isn't because police cars need gas and part, you know, buildings need light, et, et cetera. So yeah, I I think we're, I agree. Yeah, I, I think we're, we're we're kind of saying the, the, the same thing from from different uh, different sides. So Jeff uh, uh, Jeff C, I know you're uh, you have an opportunity to interact with the the. Um, select board um, a little more often than I do or most folks do. Did you have, uh, you didn't happen to bring up with them the discussion we had last meeting about trying to find an off cycle time in the spring and summer to address some of these um, uh, concerns or make a, a better long term plan? Um, I did not, no. Okay. Um, and uh, I I've not forgotten uh, about that. Uh, yeah, I think that given the, all the other priorities and then the, you know, the movement toward uh, the FY25 uh, budget, it, in my opinion, it, it wouldn't get uh, much of an audience right now to, uh, you know, to try to get that into their uh, in, into the thinking, but mm -hmm. I think once we've passed this budget cycle, then yeah, absolutely. I think that's an opportunity to uh, to have some discussion about that and and you know, kind of pick, uh, pick the brain of the executive branch a bit and kind of see what uh, you know what, what's what's the thought. and and yeah, Dan, Dana might be well. In, uh, are more informed uh, uh, than most of us here, given the work on the master planning committee. Uh, that's trying to chart, that is charting uh, the future that uh, people you know, wish for the town. Yeah, maybe that maybe that's part of why I'm more sensitive to it, just having been in some of those meetings and kind of feeling a similar level of angst from folks that as they finalize that plan, at least at the strategic level, it feels a bit more like more of the same, but just better, but doesn't feel significantly different. And I think as the folks on that committee are coming to the end of the process, they're, they're a little concerned that maybe it hasn't not going to move the needle like it needs to or it's not it's not directionally different it's not significant change and i think they're a little concerned about how it's going to fall on the town right how the town's going to receive that hmm. yeah that's a i'd say a, a fair concern given uh, all the work that's that's gone into a, a plan that's to by its definition chart the town's course for what the next 10 years so, so dan no, how do you how something do you... transformational then that needs to happen uh within the next 10 years so dan dan no, I, when when you when i hear people say you know the uh this potential plan that's coming together doesn't have the impact that perhaps people were hoping for i'm trying to figure out like um how do we define that how do you define that like is this if you were able to reduce the tax burden 
on the pop on the citizenry by 10 percent you know one path versus another path right the path we're on now versus the is that material enough for them to care about or does it um you know is it have to be a 25 percent you know reduction is that what they're you're using for like your your thought process for its material or it's not or it's it's going to do what we want or it's not yeah really good question Santa. i think as far as my understanding of the process and how it goes this is at a strategic level and then there's a next level down of execution um and which would be tied to measurable outcomes and so some of the components of the plan have to do with fiscal benefit to the town or fiscal responsibility or responsible development from a fiscal standpoint and in the last meeting they actually we talked a bit about what could some of those metrics be and I unfortunately wasn't super helpful except to say that we as a town are still from the finance committee to the town administration I don't know that we have a great definition of what is fiscally successful for us if you listen to some of the folks on the select board it's valuations went way up that's actually a measure of success from some people's perspective or it's our spending relative to other towns per capita or so anyway i i didn't help a whole lot even on defining the metric let alone what a change in the metric would be i think that would be something super valuable for us to do as a committee really help push to refine what our measures of success are Sorry, I don't have a better answer. Except no, the general that. sense, I think when people feel when people feel like we haven't made a significant change in direction with the plan, the general sense is everybody's worried about taxes. And if we present a plan that doesn't say anything or or really give some legitimacy to this this having some future impact on our taxes, it's not going to be well received. Mm -hmm. I recall, uh, uh, Dano, that I think the committee was going back to Cambridge uh, Econometrics. Is that the name of the, the firm? Did an analysis of you know, what would move the needle in terms of uh, uh, commercial or uh, other development. Uh, is that correct that the committee did engage that firm again to look a little harder at those opportunities or what those opportunities could possibly uh, uh, provide in, in terms of relief? They did, yeah. We asked the Cambridge Econometrics folks to refine their assumptions and choose better comparables for some of their assumptions, and they were willing to do that, and Steve worked with them on that, and that's in process. Uh, okay. Yeah, I was curious if the, the results of that additional work had been uh, shared. I mean, I think that's part of, I had connected separately with somebody on the committee about <laughs> our constraints are just so <laughs> constraining as a town with the amount of land that's developable that uh, given whatever rules and wetlands and everything else that uh, we're in a bit, yeah, between a rock and a hard place. You could choose different assumptions, but at the end of the day, there's only so much square footage of developable land. Um, it's not, yeah, it's not an easy optimization exercise. There's yeah. no easy answer, which is the same place we're at. <clears throat> I've just, hopefully I have, thank you uh, for that. Um, are you all seeing the screen now that reads FY25 requests? That's the yeah. uh, budget, capital budget proposed uh, last night, as you can see. And I'll just touch on this briefly. 
uh, maybe I'll put it on the agenda uh, for an upcoming meeting to uh, dive a little deeper into it. Uh, yeah, particularly after we've had a chance to talk with the uh, uh, public safety uh, officials, as you can see, much of the spending uh, uh, is in that area. Uh, so you can see that as proposed, the departments have requested approximately 1.6 million uh, in capital spend, which by this analysis could be covered uh, by free cash. However, uh, the far right-hand column uh, is what the town administrator uh, is proposing or recommending to uh, select board uh, be spent so what is that? Uh, just just over half of the requested. Uh, he is uh, in support of of actually spending. So that figure is eight hundred forty two thousand. And Jeff, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean the only uh, clarification I would make to that is that um, one of the things we did is we wanted to put into the slides and highlight like sort of a lot of the things that could have, um, you know, could have been asked for or whatever. And the very last one, um, the, um, the dump truck, the dump truck for uh, 255, 577, that actually wasn't a, a request by Rich and the DPW that's in there for sort of illustrative purposes yeah. to show like, that's what, you know, so really the actual request is like closer to like 1.3 um not a huge difference but i just wanted to point that out it was just we were just trying to show you know that you know that's your dpw director saving you you know roughly yes, uh yes. 200 140,000 uh, or whatever there um so you know the request was a little bit lower but yeah so basically this is you know the requests is everything all in and then you know steve went through and sort of gave his recommendations you know in conjunction with you know with the department heads you know the the reduction on the um road capital spending the, you know what we spend over and above our chapter 90 um you know we because we're getting another 80 or 90 thousand dollars worth of um money from the millionaires tax you know, we're able to, um, you know, spend a little bit less out of our free cash uh, and still actually get more road work done than we were, you know, planning on before we heard about the millionaire's tax uh, revenue stream, um, you know, and yes. things like that. That was emphasized last night that uh, Rich uh, Souza is, is supportive of that reduction and feels like you know, with the, you know, the money coming from the millionaire's tax and fifty thousand dollars, yeah, he can uh, adequately uh, maintain uh, the roads and do the work that he feels uh, needs to be done in fiscal year uh, twenty five. Was there any discussion and, last night over what happened to the grant for the radios? Uh, so what we, yes, we heard was it wasn't approved. Uh, I'm actually, you know, I'm not sure. Um, you know, what, what the reasoning is there. Uh, I've heard a couple of different things, um, nothing that I've been able to really substantiate, but, um, you know, it's, it's very disappointing. Uh, I know most of the communities around us were able to get, um, you know, similar grants for radios uh, and, and listening to, uh, you know, Jeff Baxter and, and um, Steve Cavanaugh talk about how old the radios are and uh, things like that. It's, it's really sort of hard to imagine uh, that we couldn't have gotten them um, so very disappointing, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, we're always trying to get grant money, but, you know, not receiving it doesn't, uh, you know, eliminate the need for the, the communication equipment. And so, um, you know, they talked at length last night about, you know, just the challenges of, um, you know, I think, I think the police radios are um, about 15 years old. The DB, or the um, fire department radios are about 20 years old. Uh, they've both, both of them have reached the point where, you know, even replacement parts are, you know, are not really available. Uh, so things go from yeah, being an active, you know, radio to being old equipment in order to keep uh, the, yeah, the other equipment uh, in working yeah. order. You know, but it's, it's truly a safety yeah, issue. I mean, I'm in favor, I'm in favor of the radios, but it also, so two years ago, I think there was another situation where we could have had grant money for replacement of certain pieces of equipment and the towns around us got it. And for some reason we didn't again, 
And so it would just be good to know what the specific reasons are to understand if we're doing something wrong in the grant process. Um, as a, you know, I think these are things we need to get anyway, but it'd be good to know, like, why did we not get these things? Was it administrative? Was it something we're doing in the town, like that we're not eligible or something like that? Yeah, and I'm I'm trying to like you know in Essex we've been fairly successful with grants and so you know I'm talking to folks there to you know see if they have any input on what we could do or whatever. I mean I do think sometimes there is um, you know there is a little bit of a bias. So um, you know a community like Wenham or Manchester might be a little less likely to get a grant than say Essex would, uh, just sort of based on the you know socioeconomics of things. Um, you know, that's me speculating a little bit, but I do think there is some legitimacy to that. Um, of course, if Hamilton got a grant and, and Wenham didn't, I mean, you wouldn't, I mean, those are fairly comparable communities. So, so yeah, I mean, I think it's worth looking into. I've talked a little bit to Steve about that and just, you know, is there a way we can, you know, make the grant process work better, um, you know, for everyone involved um, and, and things like that? Because, yeah, certainly we want to be availing ourselves of any, you know, any sort of aid that's out there um you know for these types of you know essential pieces of equipment um so i didn't realize that there was another one potentially that we had an issue with prior to this this is the only one i had, had heard about so far uh, and we'll have an opportunity to to yeah, dig into that uh, a bit deeper with uh, fire and uh, and police, but one of the messages uh, that was clear last night was that the uh, the proposed spending uh, at two hundred and twenty nine thousand dollars will acquire the communications equipment. It's it's sitting on the uh, the fire department line item here, but that's for both departments. Uh, so that will equip both police and fire with radios that can communicate with one another and with the uh, emergency services uh, departments that uh, assist Essex, which uh, as they were explaining last night uh, is particularly frustrating that if Manchester or uh, another surrounding community uh, comes uh, to assist a situation uh, in Wenham, uh, it's not possible for Wenham to communicate with them, which seems uh, absurd so that's that'll be resolved so why don't we maybe we hold uh, more discussion on those items again we, we do have those uh the chiefs of the two departments uh, yeah, coming only, to join us next week uh jeff the only observation i have that i just point out is you know, and they uh, they've got a couple items it's very and it's i know we're doing sort of catch up it appears to be very sort of internally focused and I get the sort of communication equipment. We can't have issues with those, with those sorts of things. But if I, from a resident taxpayer standpoint, it sort, you know, we used to say in banking, run the bank, build the bank, where's the build the bank. And that's, that's the part that I think, and, and I get it, it's a money issue, but where is the part where it's sort of, either the capital budget or the operating mm -hmm. budget where we've moved the town needle forward for the resident. Mm -hmm. That's the yeah. thing I'm, I'm thinking about. What can we point to besides we've tried to contain mm -hmm. costs to bring a better experience, mm -hmm. a better facility, something that we can point to that we did to sort of move the ball down the field. And part of it is we're in rebuilding years in terms of staffing and CapEx and technology, but that was my one observation on the sure. on the budget, on the capital budget was like, I really wanted to, uh, I was thinking we might be able to get a little bit more down the track, even with volunteerism in the senior center, just some constituent that could say, we kind of moved, we were able to take the dollars that we had and, and sort of advance the ball. But that that's just an overall, overall observation, sure. you know? Yeah, I think uh, well, Jeff could uh, Soulard could certainly uh, offer a little in insight into that, but I think that uh, frankly, I think that was discouraged. That was you know, given the the, the budget uh, constraint, 
and uh, the the desire to to increase uh, or even establish some additional reserve or stabilizations funds, uh, I think, uh, yeah, discouraged uh, folks from looking uh, at an expansion of service or uh, uh, doing just as you're, you've suggested. Yeah, I think, um, you know, if you look at the very top one, um, you know, under con Council on Aging, which I know, you know, David is is on and, and you know, uh, as all of us do, finds it, you know, an important place to invest. I think that top one is not funded in the recommendations. And I think that's more that was more of a wanting a more holistic plan on what we could do in that basement rather than sure. just throwing some new floor, you know, flooring in there like. Yeah. You know, um, you know, but that that being said, I guess Steve did particularly mention that one item of, you know, maybe if we do have some more money, um, you know, if, if things shake out a little, a little differently and we've got a little some extra funds, maybe that is something that we put back on the table. Um, but, you know, I mean, honestly, it was your conversation uh, with Steve uh, after the Saturday meeting, you know, uh, in December, um, you know, that I think perked his interest in, you know, but maybe there is something, you know, like you say, to move things further down the track there that, you know, rather than just saying, oh, we threw, you know, $8,000 with the vinyl down in the basement, right, um, right. To instead exactly. have next year, you know, something that's like, we're proposing a $29,000 project that will exactly. redo the flooring, fix this and add, you know, whatever, an indoor pickleball court, you know, it's so, right. something, you know, something new and exciting. So I think, yeah. you know, that's on the table, but I think you sort of hit the nail on the head a little bit with, you know, where there's been a lot of turnover and all kinds of sort of challenges and went for several years now, you know, we are in a bit of a sort of rebuilding, restocking, um, you know, getting back to the just, you know, the, the basics of making sure everybody's got the right equipment yeah. uh, to do their jobs and service, you know, service folks and things like that. Um, yeah, I mean, like you say, I mean, even something like, you know, paint the exterior of the library. I mean, it's, it's, it's important, it, you know, it, it isn't necessarily, you know, it, increasing the experience at the library for the average resident, you know, per se, but it, it is investing in the library. It's just unfortunately not something that's exciting or new uh, or whatever. But, but yeah, I would, the, the hope would be that, you know, now you've got a team and some continuity and, and things like that, that, you know, you work out of this phase of sort of restocking uh, and, and doing the bare minimum uh, to, to, you know, uh, doing some capital things that are maybe adding to the experience in different places. Um, but yeah, I think we're heavily in that just sort of re restocking phase right now. Yeah, understood. So why don't I uh, just try to re recap? Um, it, it didn't sound like there was any heartburn on uh, any of those general uh, uh, areas of of spending, general uh, government, public works, health, and human services, uh, and, and water. Uh, we will have public service join us next week, uh, and we can dive deeper into their operating uh, budget and capital uh, budget requests, and we'll continue this process of trying to uh, kind of narrow our our, our focus on to uh, areas that might need uh, any continued discussion. Uh, and I guess with, with that, I'll, I'll just ask the group if there's uh, anything uh, you wish to uh, bring up as a kind of an open discussion point. Uh, and if not, uh, we'll entertain a motion to bring our meeting to a close. Not seeing any raised hands, I'll, I'll make the motion to uh, <laughs> close today's FinCom meeting. I'll second that motion. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, all in favor of closing the Wenham Finance Committee meeting at 8 to 12 p.m. on January 17th. Jeff Calder, yes. Dave Harnish, yes. Finn Sprague, yes. Scott Schoenberger, yes. Dan, oh, yes. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a good night.